Uh, okay. So before I start, I'm gonna do a small poll so I can get to see who y'all are and where you are are wise. So I'm hoping everyone can see the poll and just uh, answer it so I can kind of get a feel for where I should be, where I should be aiming at. Well, this is actually working, that's cool. I've never used this poll function before, so this is, uh, yeah, this is cool. Nice. So we have quite a lot of diversity in, in um, people who've used R quite a lot um, and people who have not used it a lot. Um, and then also how frequent, uh, frequently people use R. Okay, so that's, um, that's cool. So today <clears throat> I'm gonna um, do small like, I'm gonna do a fairly quick introduction to our markdown itself, because there are a lot of really, really good resources about um, our markdown um, and markdown more in general. I will go into the distinction very shortly. Um, and um, I don't feel I, I should be giving you an, like, an extensive guide to our markdown nitpickity, because you can find that very easily online. So I would, would rather um, go to like the more, the other practicalities in Markdown that I found tricky when I started, uh, the things that I have found out fairly recently, let's say within the last six months that have completely blown my mind <laughs> when it comes to our Markdown. Um, and a little bit about like um, the pitfalls I've seen um, that I've, uh, the pitfalls I've experienced uh, and that killed my uh, productivity for maybe a day because I couldn't understand what was wrong. I will try to spare you <laughs> that pain. Um, and then uh, also gonna sh like give you some sneak peeks of packages that uses that use our markdown. So so while I the the title of my talk is reports to impress your boss. It's actually not just reports to impress your boss. There are like lots of things to impress your boss. There are reports and there's resumes and there's blogs and there's books and there's, um, yeah, you can do a lot with Markdown. Um, and that's where we're gonna go today. So, <clears throat> What is Markdown and what is our Markdown? So uh, Markdown is, it's something called a, a rich text format. So what that means is that it's based on just plain text and by um, wrapping plain text in certain special characters that indicates to an engine that knows how to interpret Markdown, how this text uh, should be rendered. So that sounds a lot like a, a lot of mumbo jumbo. You will see what it means very soon. But one of the very, very cool things about it is that if you get a document from someone written in Markdown um, and you don't have an engine that reads Markdown, that doesn't matter because you can still read the plain text. So you won't know what the double stars mean, okay. It doesn't matter, you can still read the word. So it's not like if someone sends you a Word document, you need to either have MS Office Word installed or LibreOffice um, installed to open that document, um, which not everyone has. Uh, it's almost ridiculous how, uh, how, how normal Word has been despite it actually being quite expensive. Um, so it's a way of formatting text, just using text. So you can read it in any type of text editor. Uh, another thing that is cool with it is um, because it's plain text format, it means that a version control uh, software like uh, Git can actually track sentence for sentence um, changes. 
which is extremely convenient if you collaborate a lot, um, and I do. Um, so it really gives you a very like uh, clear log history and timeline of the changes made in your document uh, and who made them, which is super convenient. Um, and so, so that's just Markdown. Markdown is very often used in like um, internet settings, um, and we'll see why uh, soon. And so, our Markdown is just a special instance of Markdown. It uses most of the same plain text formatting that uh, that Markdown does, but it also incorporates something called code chunks. And it's in the code chunks that our Markdown becomes genius because you suddenly have the ability to combine uh, this plain text uh, format that you could write anything you want and make bold and italicized text and all these things, and then chuck in some code that will run in R and output something directly into your document. So instead of having a figure made by your script in R and then having R output a PNG or, or a TIFF image um, into a separate file and then having to import that into, for instance, Word, R Markdown will just immediately insert it into your document where it is. No need to copy, no need to like be afraid that it's going to jump around the page once you write like a single sentence or you try to move it like a millimeter and then suddenly it disappears and you don't know where it is. As you can hear, I have a lot of experience with that in Word. It's quite frustrating. Um, there are other things that can be tr frustrating with figures in our markdown, but it will not jump around in the same way and it will not uh, just disappear because you moved it a millimeter the wrong way. Um, so it is quite powerful. So what, but what is it? I'm talking, I've been talking for like uh, 10 minutes and you still don't know what it is. So this is basically what um, markdown text and rendered markdown text look like. So on the left hand side here is what would be written in markdown to make bold text. And on the side here, you can see how it's actually rendered. In this case, I'm and because this whole presentation is written in our markdown, <laughs> it is also very easy for me to show you exactly the input of our mark, uh, the input markdown and the outputted rendered uh, version of markdown. And then you have italicized text. This is kind of my preference of how to do it. There are variations here, but I'm not going to go into it right now because that can be confusing to you, but this is my preference, I use a double star to write bold text. I use a single underscore to make italicized text. To make a quote, uh, you use this um, smaller than sign. And then you, in this case, you get um, the quotation go is indented slightly and it has this mark in the end. Uh, this is not universal. This is specific to this HTML document. Again, I will go through what that means. You can make ordered lists um, in this way. And there's, there's a funny thing happening here. Uh, and I don't know if you can notice, but actually in the ordered list I made here, it actually says one twice, but the rendered text is uh, one, two. And that is because our markdown understands the second you go one dot, space and then something that this should be an ordered list the one indicated that this is like there's an order to this i wanted i want numbers indicating something and then it doesn't matter the number you put after here it will just start counting sequentially um which is pretty nice so you don't have to think about or remember like is it one or two or if you take away an item and move it you have to change all of them no it just does it for you it's pretty neat um you have unordered lists, which are just normal bullet points, and you can have sub items. And this is literally what it would look like in the document and in the rendered version. And oh, sorry, my mouse was a bit um, uh, sensitive there. And as you can see, as I, I noted before, like, 
you can read the markdown text directly um, and understand what it says. It's not like if you, if you can't open a Word document in a, in a normal text editor. It's just like lots of coded Cyrillic weird things that make absolutely no sense because it's a binary file. So it, you can't read it that way. But Markdown, since it's just plain text, you can read it anyway. You won't get the nice formatting, okay, so that's okay, but you can still read it. <clears throat> and this is uh, examples of what headers uh, look like. So in um, Markdown, we use hashtags for headers. Um, and then the more hashtags you ha have, the further down the, um, the title uh, ladder, let's say, they are. So a header of level one has one hashtag, a header of level two has two hashtags and so on. And I think usually there's like a maximum of four or five sublevels. If you need a lot more than that, you might need to kind of rethink the structure of your paper perhaps. <clears throat> uh, okay, so this, so what you can see on the left side of the screen here is um, the markdown text and on the right side of the screen is the rendered version of that exact same text. Um, so it's pretty neat. You can see I even added an image with this very, very weird syntax. That's just a thing you kind of learn <laughs> at some point. <laughs> um, it becomes very ingrained. Uh, it is very close to how you also make a link in an R markdown or in a markdown document. So, so it's quite easy um, to remember. And it, in this case, it's just pointing to a path um, relative to where my document is. So I have a folder called images and in images, I have a file, an image file called rnd.png and that's what's uh, rendered uh, on the right hand side. So does this seem fairly clear? Like I'm going pretty fast here. So we you know, uh, so you're all muted, so I don't know. Um, Am I going too fast, too slow? I think you're all good. Yeah? Yeah, just keep oh, yeah. it up. Good, okay. So it really is just text. I, I, I know I'm saying this a lot, <laughs> but, it's, um, but to me it's kind, of, it's kind of a little bit magical that it really is just text and it's doing all of these um, formatting things behind the scenes without us really needing to understand how it's happening or why it works. Um, and it's really easy. It's really easy to distribute to anyone because they don't need specialized software. Um, and it's really easy to adapt by others because again, they don't need specialized software. So um, when some of our PhDs uh, in my lab where I work at the University of Oslo, um, started working on on markdown like one of the things I did was I just made like a very simple document to them um, that they could kind of use and build upon instead of sometimes it feels intimidating to start something completely from scratch because you don't even know what the possibilities are so it's good to have like a, a small kind of guide uh, um, guide basically to to help you work and that that helps they, kind of gets you going and that's super easy because it's just text I make it it was like I don't know three kilobytes or something like ridiculously small um, they could just start working <clears throat> as I mentioned what really makes our markdown special because um, what we saw before was that was just normal markdown that was no our markdown needed um, just normal markdown so what makes our markdown special are the code chunks. Um, code chunks are very, very special uh, to our markdown and they are uh, what make it really tick. At the bottom here, you can see uh, a small code chunk that I made. It has this syntax of starting with three backward ticks. So you're gonna need to learn where the backward ticks are on your keyboard. And that is different for every country and keyboard. So <laughs> I only know where they are on a Norwegian Mac. Sorry about that. Um, 
in this case, I have three backward ticks and an R, which tells our markdown that we're doing an R chunk. Um, and then I'm loading in, oh, sorry, my mouse is very, 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 very sensitive. I don't even know how I jumped that far. Okay, I'm loading in um, ggplot2, making a ggplot out of the very fascinating data set empty cars. I'm sure you've never seen or heard about empty cars before. And I'm making a plot. And the output of that plot uh, is in this case uh, showed on, on the right hand side. Uh, and that code is exactly, it literally is what making that, that plot on the side. There's no, I haven't done any extra magic. That is literally what is producing that plot. Um, and by combining your text and code chunks in this way, you can actually start writing a whole paper. And I recently just published a paper <laughs> as all done in R Markdown. I didn't touch any other program. It was all done in R Markdown. And um, okay, there were some pains, I have to admit, but it was very, very easy to update. Uh, <laughs> so it was very, very nice. <clears throat> so what, so how can so how can our markdown or markdown go from this very very plain text format to to actually a report like an html report or a pdf report even a word document yes i have done it i have gone from markdown our markdown to word because i have collaborators that insist on using word so i need to be able to do that um, and amazingly enough i can uh, so that's pretty awesome so how does it do that? So there's like a pipeline that our Markdown goes through um, to, to create its end result. It's not crucial for you to know this, but I think it's good to have in the back of your mind because it can be useful when things start um, not working for you. And at some point there will be a bug or, or you will try to do something and for some reason it's, it's not succeeding. And then it's good to have this pipeline in mind because then you can maybe start thinking about where the problem is arising. So we start with an R markdown document, uh, which has this RMD ending. Um, it goes through the knit R package, um, which now comes default uh, with at least uh, every R studio. It is installed uh, by default. Um, and knit R turns our markdown into markdown, normal markdown. So it will execute all of your code chunks, um, create the figures and the tables and the uh, code chunk outputs um, in, uh, in markdown. And then that markdown document is sent through another engine called Pandoc, um, which is extremely, uh, well named um, because it can turn that markdown document into almost anything else you want. Um, so there's at least at least support for Word and, and PDF and HTML, different types of PDFs and different types of HTML. Um, I said word, PowerPoint presentations. I've never tried that, but I know that it's possible. Um, yeah, lots and lots of stuff. Um, so you can really, like, if you have collaborators or you're going to some place and they're like, we have to have the presentation in PowerPoint, we do not accept anything else, uh, and you have your presentation in our markdown, you can just go, yeah, okay, well, I'll just turn it into a PowerPoint presentation. You can actually do that. Uh, not arbitrarily simple necessarily, but it is possible and it shouldn't be that hard. So, and at any step of this, things can go wrong. So if there's something wrong with your R code, knit R will fail um, and give you an R warning or error because something in your R code isn't working. Um, the change uh, from Pandoc to whatever, uh, anything else can also uh, fail because there's something going wrong. 
uh, for instance, um, while knitting to PDF, I do that quite a lot. Uh, is amazing and it, it usually creates really, really nice PDFs. Sometimes it will fail because it goes through um, because it goes through latex, actually, it goes from markdown to latex to PDF. And latex is, I don't know latex, I'm very poor understanding of how latex works. So when I get in late, latex error, I really start struggling to see what the problem is. Thankfully, I have coworkers that kind of do know latex, and now I'm slowly starting to, to um, learn from the same mistakes and how to fix them, <laughs> which is good. Um, yeah. So I'm just gonna, so now you have some background. I've spent like 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes giving you some um, markdown and R markdown background. And now I'm gonna show you the thing I discovered completely by accident one day when I was working on a script. Uh, I had recently been working on an R markdown report. Um, so I was very, very, I had the shortcut to start knitting my report very much in my fingers. So there's a keystroke shortcut uh, you can use that will just, if you're in an R markdown document, it will, it will start knitting it for you. Uh, and I did that all the time so it had kind of become just like you know like you would you go control save for every second you were working it was kind of the same i would go control um command shift k which will start knitting i was doing that all the time so i was working on this script and suddenly i did that while in the script so we're talking about a normal r script not an r markdown document and i suddenly had the option of starting to knit that and I had no idea you could do that. So um, I am now going to share with you another screen, which I hope you can see. Well, this is actually where my presentation uh, is at the moment. Kind of minimize it a bit. So here I have a small script <clears throat> based on the Gapminder data. I hope you can see. Um, see it okay if it needs to be any bigger or smaller um, please let me know so my small script here is just uh, reading in gapminder data um, make it slightly bigger i can make it a bit bigger yeah it's a bit too much maybe okay um i hope that helped a little bit all right so I'm reading in the Gapminder data and assigning it to the Gapminder data uh, object. I'm making a small summary of it so I have an idea of what's in this data in case, um, in case I'm not familiar with it. I make a small plot of the variables of interest. I do a little linear model and I do a model inspection at the end. So usually I would just run all of this sequentially um, and look at my our out uh, my console output. And there's no so there's no button here to indicate to me that I can make a document out of this in any way. But I know so on a Norwegian Mac. <laughs> sorry, I'm pretty sure that this goes for at least every Mac, and I'm pretty sure on a Windows uh, it's pretty similar. So for me, it's Command Shift K. And I'm pretty sure on the windows, it's um, control shift K. And if I do that keystroke now, uh, I'm hoping you can see that. Um, <clears throat> I get a small window saying compile, rem com uh, compile report from our script. Um, this was, I had no idea you could do this. And, and while it's not necessarily the perfect way to make a report, if you have a script and someone really, really quickly wants to see the script and see the output of that script, this is a very quick way for you to just give it to them. Like you don't have to do anything else. I, mean, I just have to press compile. And I'm sorry, my, my console is on the other side here, which is a little bit weird. 
Uh, it's a setup I got used to at some point. Um, and now I'm wondering, can you see this window though? Can you? No, we can't. No, okay, give me a second. I will share. I'm just gonna clear the desktop of something else and then I'm gonna share my entire desktop, which I think Can you see it now? <laughs> oh, okay. You probably could for a small second. Yes, I got it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, and there you go. This is my script. Uh, so, I mean, as I said, it's not perfect. It's not, it's not amazing. It's not necessarily something I would, um, give to someone and say I'm super proud of how amazing this looks. Um, I mean, the title is just the name of my script, which is in itself stupid. It's the username on my computer. It's today's date, which I guess is fine. But, but literally here you can see the code run. This is the code in my script. This maps perfectly to what is here. So if I put them side by side, This is this part. You can see it here in this bird. So it's making a code chunk basically um, of the first part. And it's giving the output of the summary, which is not necessarily very interesting in this case, but I, it's something I've made. And then comes the ggplot um, code. Then comes the plot. Uh, amazingly, pretty nice resolution. It's placed pretty decently. Then comes the model stuff and the model output. Again, this model output is not perfect. It's not a table I would put in a paper, but if I'm just giving it to a coworker because they wanna see what I did, uh, maybe try the same code, um, I don't have to sit and spend like 20 minutes fixing up my script, making it pretty into an R markdown. I can just do this, give it to them, and then they have everything they need as long as they have access to the same data as I have. Uh, or maybe they don't even want to run it on the same data. They want to run the same stuff on, a, on another data set. So it's, I was, yeah, I was so surprised and so happy that um, I found this by accident. You can make any, you can make any R script um, into a document, um, which is amazing. In this case, I also chose to make it into a PDF. That was the thing I chose. Uh, you can choose to do it in HTML um, and you can even do Word. I am just daring enough to do that. Um, well, I did test run this, so I know that it works. <laughs> uh, and for some reason it opened Skype and someone tell like, this is, um, uh, it's, I don't want Skype. Um, and for some reason, it never actually opens the document, but I know it's here. And there you go. Um, this is a Word document with all the stuff in it. So it's Command Shift K or Control Shift K if you're on a Windows machine or uh, Linux, I guess. Um, yeah. So it's. Um, yeah, this is this is by far like the best um, just random uh, thing I discovered uh, that I wanted to share. Uh, I find it completely amazing. It's super super nice. But of course, like if you're making a proper report for work, and like if you you're gonna show it to your boss or or your boss is gonna show it to their boss, um, yeah, you're gonna wanna clean it up a bit. Uh, and make it look a little bit nicer. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm based on this script. We're gonna close this Word document now because I get anxious working in Word um, from a bad experience once. So to start an R Markdown document, it's uh, quite simple. Um, 
you either go to file or to the little arrow, downwards arrow in the new file section um, in our studio, and you choose our markdown. I'm going to choose to do a simple HTML document. Um, and we're going to call it simple, well, I can't spell, simple report. <clears throat> and what happens is that R automatically opens up this R markdown template that already has some content. Now you're going to want to remove all of this content, obviously, because it has no relation to the report you're making. But the good thing about starting the R doc um, the markdown document this way is that you get some sort of like idea of how an R markdown document should look, even though you maybe never have made one before. So you have this top part here, which is weird. It has nothing to do with R <laughs> um, or R markdown in itself. It's a header called a YAML and it has some special features and I'm not going to go a lot into the YAML. Again, there's lots of information about that online and I have lots of links in my slides, which I'm also posting uh, on our GitHub account later. So, so you will have that. Don't be afraid. I have all the links to all of the resources you need, or at least a lot of them. <clears throat> um, I, but just a quick question. Someone asked, what's the difference between R Markdown and R Notebook? All right. That's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a tricky question. I am not, um, I'm not completely confident in, in the difference between the two other than um, an R notebook is, is a type of, uh, is a type of R markdown, but it is made to run sequentially. So it's made for someone to sit with it and like kind of run, read, read the stuff uh, that's written there, run the code, read the stuff that's written there, run the code while um, the type of documents I'll be talking about are more about making finished reports, not something you're giving to someone to run through and kind of learn something in that way, but um, more of a static kind of thing. Um, I never actually used notebooks. Um, I tried once and it, I didn't get the feel for it. Um, uh, but I think it's closer. So I think um, if you're familiar with uh, Jupyter Notebooks, I think the R Notebooks are supposed to be the kind of equivalents uh, of, of Jupyter Notebooks for, for R specifically. I'm sorry I don't have like a much better answer than that. But I think that's a, not... that's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, Okay, so there are, there are lots of things you can put in a YAML, but to begin with, this is pretty easy. There's the title, uh, it's my name. I'm gonna put in some spaces um, because it looks nicer. Um, it's the date, you can keep it, take it away, it doesn't matter. So none of this, of these three top parts are necessary for the document, but this output part is because it's basically telling uh, NIDR um, and Pandoc what the end result of this document should be. In this case, I want an HTML document out. It's necessary. If we take that away, it doesn't know what to do anymore. The YAML can have so much metadata and it really depends on the template um, that, um, it really depends on the template that you're using um, I'm not going to go into that, but any type of um, template, uh, package, whatever uh, that uses R markdown usually has very, very good information of what um, uh, what type of metadata you can put in the YAML that will go through. And we're going to see some examples of that um, towards uh, the end when I go through a couple of the a couple of my favorite uh, packages that are based on R Markdown content. So it is very, very different. It really, really depends on, on what your end result is going to be. <clears throat> okay, so I mean, we have this template now, so I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and knit it just to make sure that it works and that it's making what it is. So you can see now that 
Now I have this button here that says knit. It even has this nice little yarn and uh, uh, knitting needles, uh, which is <laughs> the sign for, for knit art. Um, we can press that. Oh, I need to save it. So I'm just gonna call it simple report. Uh, and then it will do it. So this is another, this actually exemplified a little bit another cool thing uh, with NIDAR uh, or with R Markdown itself. For you, you to be able to knit the document, the R Markdown file needs to be saved, meaning that if you've knit it, you've saved it. So whenever you knit your document, you automatically also save it at the same point, at the same time. So you don't have to be like anxious that, it's, uh, that you're gonna lose it. If you remember knitting it, you have your last uh, changes in the document. So I never leave a document without uh, having knitted first. <laughs> and I'm completely sure that everything is, uh, everything is saved. <clears throat> and then you can see here, like, so it's, this is like the default R markdown um, thing. It's basically, I kind of made my simple script based on this, but with some other data and a ggplot instead, basically. So there's a title, it's the same as this title here. And there's a subtitle, another subtitle, including plots, and then there's a plot, okay. Okay, it even gives us, um, it even gives us a hint at the end here, which we're gonna use soon. But now, I mean, I don't want any of this because I want my own code in here. I'm just gonna delete it. Um, and since, my random script is quite small. I'm just gonna take all of that and paste it into here. Now, if I knit this, it's not gonna be very inter interesting. So I'm gonna do it just to exemplify. So this is what happens when you knit it and it just looks like text. So we haven't made any code chunks of our code. So knit R just thinks that this is normal text and is rendering it as normal text, uh, not very interesting. That's not what we're after. So we need to wrap all our code into code chunks. And at the top here, you can see there's already a code chunk. I'm gonna, we're gonna soon see exactly what this code chunk is doing, but we're gonna leave it for now. Um, and we're gonna start wrapping our bits of code into code chunks. So, the first word to, way to learn to do this is to use the insert button that is up here on the right hand corner of the, of the document uh, pane. You can just do insert R and it inserts an R code chunk for you. So you see it has a three double, uh, it has a three, three back ticks and then a square bracket with R indicating that this is R code. And then we put our code in there. Okay, so that's one piece. We're gonna make another one. So there, again, there are keyboard shortcuts to making our code chunks. Um, I am actually not sure about this one on a Windows machine and I'm sorry about that. So if anyone knows, please <laughs> write that in the, <laughs> in the chat. On um, Mac, the shortcut for adding um, an R code chunk is command option I for insert. Um, this was also revolutionary for me when I learned it because it became a little bit tedious. Um, since I do write um, our markdown quite a lot, it became a bit tedious to do this all the time. Uh, I don't like, I try to use my mouse as little as possible because it's, it's time consuming. Um, yeah, control alt I sounds about, sounds about right. Um, they try to be quite consistent between Windows and, and, um, and Mac, so it's not too different. Okay, so now I've wrapped all of our code um, into R code chunks, specifically R code chunks. So if we try knitting this again, so this is what we had before, before we wrapped it into code chunks. And when we knit it now, hopefully, yay! That looks more or less uh, exactly the same <laughs> as the document I made before when I just made a knit out of the script I had. 
The difference being that um, now the hashtags are actually making headlines instead of being comments in code. Um, because in R code, a hashtag means a comment. So that's not code to be executed. But in R markdown, a hashtag means uh, it's a headline. Um, but it's not, I mean, these headlines are not particularly pretty. Uh, it's not necessarily what we're after either, but this is all a bit messy now, if you agree. So if you're giving this to someone that doesn't care about R, doesn't know R, has no interest in knowing what the code that made this content is. Um, and if you're making a report, in many cases, you will have that. You will, people will not want to know the code making it. They will just want the, they will just want the output. So there's a very easy way of turning out, turning off all the code chunk. Up. So the turning off, showing the code, but only showing the output of the code, which is what you might want. So at the top here, we have a code chunk that has been called setup. And it has a setting called include false, uh, meaning that this code will be run, but the output of it will not be shown anywhere. Um, so neither the code will be shown or the output of the code, but we want the code to be shown. The No, we want the output of the code to be shown, but the code to be hidden. That's what we want. So we, here we have an option set. So this is this weird NIDAR thing. I never remember this by heart. This is why I'm very thankful for the template popping up as it is, because I never remember how to set this thing manually unless I have this little bit here. So what this little bit of code is, it's setting some options to NIDR um, about how the document should be rendered. In this case, a parameter called echo is set to true. Now I know that echo means to output um, what code looks like and then output the output of that code. But we don't want the code to be shown so we just shift that to false. So with echo equals false, it means that all of this code bit here that other people might not be in interested in will disappear for all of them. So if we knit that, suddenly all of the code stuff is gone. And we just have lots of weird headers, which make no sense. So the next part is to start kind of, I mean, these were comments in code. They looked fine when they were comments in code, but they don't look so good um, when they're like in a document like this. So here instead, we could write something like um, some sort of summary or intention of what this report is. And we are making a report of Global, what am I doing? Population increase by year. That's what I'm plotting later. Um, using the Gapminder data set published freely online. So I'm just writing some text. Um, I mean, that summary table doesn't look very good, but we're just going to let it be for now. Um, and if we run a prediction of population increase, now, if you run a model, it's not a prediction model. Model. Um, And um, predicting population increase by year, we get the following results. So this is just, and then we take away this because that doesn't, that's not informative anymore. So now I've just taken away the headers and I put in some text here and there. It's, and just to change how it feels. I'm going to knit it again and see what that looks like. 
Now my text has been changed to we are making a report. There's no extra headers that were kind of in the way before and a, um, model prediction or the model summary basically. Again, I wasn't very happy with this summary. I mean, I mean, that's just for me, right? No one, only people working with data care about things like that. So we're gonna take that away. No one cares about that in the report. And at the end here, we have a table. This table doesn't look like a table that you would have in a paper. It looks, I mean, it's our output. It's not pretty. <laughs> let's face it, it's not pretty. <clears throat> so let's make it a little bit prettier. So I've already used uh, some magic here with the broom package tidying up the model output, which just makes model output in R, which can be quite messy for those of you who have worked at it. They come in all sorts of different formats and it's sometimes quite frustrating to get the table exactly the way you want it. So um, the tidy function from the broom package basically grabs out what is usually the most interesting parts or what people usually will put in a table in a paper, which are the terms, the coefficients, which are called the estimate, the standard error, the statistic, and the p-values. I mean, that is, that is what people care about. It's not necessarily what people should care about, but that is what people care about. But the table here doesn't look very nice, so we're gonna use some more um, NIDAR, actually, to make it nicer. So, um, I'm gonna save the tidied model into an object called table. And then I'm going to use the knit R package cable function on the table. This is gonna make a table basically that is rendered more nicely um, for the report. So let's try running that. You see, suddenly the table looks more like a table, not like an actual code up, but still it's not necessarily what I would put in a paper, but this is an HTML report. And for an HTML report, I think this type of table looks super nice actually. I mean, this is what I would expect it to look like. So suddenly now I have a report. I mean, I would fill it out with more text, explaining more what I'm doing and, and why and all these things. Um, but this is like, this is a report. It looks much nicer than the one we rendered just from my bare script. Um, so it's much nicer to share with other people um, in this way. So now we made it into an HTML report. But what if I change my mind and I actually wanted a PDF? I mean, or my boss changes. Maybe my boss changes their mind. I'm like, no, 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 we have the system. There's a system. We need to put it in the system and then it needs to be a PDF. And I say, yeah, sure, no problem. We basically only need to do this. Um, and that's just gonna make it into a PDF instead. I hope. <laughs> Takes a little bit longer because it goes through LaTeX and then from, oh, there we go. I have this. I was hoping it wouldn't happen because it was working earlier. I updated a package. Never do that right before you're holding a talk. Um, no, I don't think it's, well, it could be the cable. Oh yeah, it was, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Millie. Um, but I did have this problem earlier and then it's it started because I did this packaging. So yeah, now it's a PDF instead. The table is suddenly not so pretty anymore. Uh, but we can fix that too with a very, very simple step, um, which only works well when it's PDF. So there are these tricks you need to know uh, when it's HTML, this thing works. When it's PDF, this thing works. And it's, it's not always, it takes some learning, but I'm hoping I'm gonna help you now. There's an um, argument called book tabs in Cable, uh, which makes much nicer tables because it formats them 
in this uh, standard uh, table format that we're much, much more used to uh, seeing. Uh, and now, obviously, yeah, no, but there is something, I'm sorry, that's annoying. It always happens when you're doing things live, right? It should have worked. It did actually work earlier today, and then I did a small update on a paper, uh, on a, on a, on a package I didn't actually think had any effect on this, but apparently it did. So sorry about that, but it would have looked very nice if it worked. Um, so this is a thing that's annoying when things start not working. I see this, this is latex errors. I'm not very good with LaTeX errors. So I'm gonna have to Is it really because the PDF is open? You can try. It usually just overwrites it. I mean that's what it's done before. Yeah, I know. It's not why. <clears throat> but it is what it is. Um I probably need Oh, I know what I did. I installed Pandoc site proc earlier today because I was working on a paper that needed it. And um, that probably messed up Pandoc itself. So, well, that's what it is. We're gonna not work with PDFs most of the day anyway, so it doesn't matter. So I'm changing it back to HTML. And then I need to remember to take away these things because they don't look good when it's HTML. So there are always like kind of these small things you need to fix between HTML or PDF um, or Word, but they're usually not that big. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna show you some of the things that are good to know when you're working with Markdown. So our document now is not very big, so it's very easy to keep like an overview of what it's looking like. But in most cases, a Markdown document uh, ends up being quite huge. Uh, there's a lot of code, there's a lot of text, and there's a lot of scrolling up and down to figure out where you're going. If you notice down here where my mouse is, there's this small thing saying chunk five, um, which is weird. If I try expanding that, actually, this is an overview of all of the code chunks that are in the document. At the moment, it's not very helpful because I haven't named anything else but my first code chunk, which is called setup. Just go, that's where we put it, it's called setup. But if you're good and clever and you name your code chunks, um, it's much, much easier to uh, navigate your document once it starts becoming humongous. So we can call this get data. I like always put them in, in single quotations. It means I can use spaces and other characters, but um, you should never actually use spaces in your code chunk names. Um, just don't do it. Just, just don't do it. It will make things bad. Um, and then we can call this ggplot. I mean, this is a very simple report, so I can call things um, very simple things, um, and that will not be confusing. And now that I've named all of my chunks, um, down here, it's super easy for me now to navigate and figure out where I am. So maybe I'm like, a hundred lines down in my document and something isn't working because some I defined something wrong in the data, then I don't have to start scrolling and figure out where the data is. No, I know that because I have a code chunk called get data, so I can just go there. And my cursor automatically jumps there. Super, super convenient. I use this a lot, uh, even though I'm often lazy and forget to name my code chunks, um, I usually, despair at some point that I haven't named them because I'm searching for things like a crazy person. Um, so my great tip to you is don't be like me, name your code chunks. It will make life easier. 
I promise. So a thick, second thing uh, in this window, and this actually works for, for a lot of different documents is, so I found this again, kind of by mistake, because I pressed the wrong thing one day. So up here in, in uh, the top right hand corner of uh, the scripts pane, there's this, there are these lines, these document lines. And if you expand that right now, it doesn't have anything because I don't have any headlines uh, in my document. But if I made some, Um, it will actually make a document outline for you. Again, this is super convenient for, for jumping up and down in your document to the sections you need to be working on or, or whatever. Um, I use this all the time now. It really, really makes working with large documents a lot easier. Um, and I highly recommend, I, I think I've been telling everyone about it since I found it. It also works in scripts, actually. Um, it will not do the hashtag headings thing as it will do, but if you know how to use R sections, it will it will function. It works with R sections. So um, I very, very much recommend using it. Um, as I said, I use it all the time. So there's this, um, where, can you see my cursor now? So there's this little, I don't even know what to call it. It's basically just lots of horizontal lines. They're supposed to look like a document, like, yeah. So by pressing that, it comes out. It's a very, very hidden feature. Um, I'm kind of sad that this is a hidden feature. For me, this is like a win. I love this feature. Um, it really is like, yeah, does make things a lot easier. Uh, cool, I'm gonna save that and we're gonna go back here. Okay, so now we've made, we've basically made an R Markdown report now. Um, it's fairly simple, but uh, in my opinion, Simple reports uh, are usually uh, what you want to be aiming for. If they're too complicated, I was working on a report recently that is just, uh, it has too many tables and the tables go over like four pages and it's just, it's mayhem. No one wants that. No one wants that. I feel very sorry for my coworkers having received <laughs> this document with the table that goes over four pages. Like it's complete. Uh, lunacy, but that's what it was. Um, but once you have a report going, and as I said in the beginning, like um, there are instances, at least in my work, where I have some report or whatever that I need to make periodically, or uh, I need to do it several times just with slightly different data. Um, and as long as you make sure your data is formatted in the correct way um, and is what you're, you want it to be, you don't want to uh, remake the same script every time for all these different things. You want to be able to use the same setup and just create that same report. It saves you lots of time. And for those of you who are part of Our Ladies Oslo and was here for our Lightning's talks before Christmas, we had a, a, a woman from the Meteorological Institute that said that uh, learning about R Markdown really like helped her save like a month uh, of work time for her every year because now she didn't need to remake these annoying reports from scratch every time. She could use the template she had from last year and just supply new data and <laughs> she would get a report. Uh, again, some finicking, but it's not a month of work. It would be like a week of work instead, much, much better. So the way to do that cleverly, like you can do that with what I already showed you, you just switch Gapminder data with some other data. But a way to do it really cleverly is to do something called parameterized reports, which I learned about when I was at RStudioConf for a couple of years ago. 
um, for me, this sounds like a bit like what it sounds super fancy. Uh, and I kind of couldn't understand what it meant until someone showed it to me. Um, so uh, as I said, reports are tedious and they take a lot of time to make. And um, before I continue going on, I super recommend watching Charlotte Gelfand's um, talk at our studio conf uh, this year, which I could not go, but Isabel, uh, one of the art ladies here, uh, did go to her talk about um, making these reports. She had to do this at the last work she was in and all the troubles she hit um, when she was making these reports and and um, and what she learned. It's it's a super good talk and you learn quite a lot about uh, how to um, how to think about uh, making a setup for yourself so it's easy for you to make these reports and save yourself a lot of time. So as it is with a lot of things, uh, it might feel like you're spending too much time investing in, in making the infrastructure good. Um, so the first time you're doing it takes you way longer. But if you've invested that time in making the infrastructure, it means that the next time you're doing it, you're saving the time basically. So it, it, it pays off in the long run basically. Um, so uh, yeah, this is where I again move to my art studio. <clears throat> so how do we make a parameterized report and what the hell is it? So when you make a parameterized, so right now we've been making our markdown documents by knitting them directly in our studio. There is, uh, another way of doing it and that is by calling our markdown uh, in the console. I'm sorry for not having the default setup. I should have fixed that before I started um, but I didn't so my console is over here. Sorry about that. Um, so another way to make an R markdown report is to use the R markdown uh, function and render uh, simple, no, I need quotation marks. And run that code and it will create the report. It won't open it like it does when you press the need R button because you're not doing it in an interactive way. Basically, you're just telling the code to do it. This is how you would do it if you would say you actually had a parameterized report that we're gonna make now and you were feeding it 50 different data sets you would want to just make a script that would just sequentially feed it the 50 different data sets and then just have it make it instead of going through one and one yourself and making them manually. Because um, we all hate manual labor, right? We want, this is the magic of programming. It does it automatically, it saves us time so we can do other fun things um, like making our lady stocks. Um, Okay, so how do we make a parameterized report? So what we mean by a parameterized report is that when we call our markdown in the console like I did, um, we actually provide it with extra variables that it will use when rendering the document. And we've set up the document in a way that it understands what these um, parameters are and how to use them. So in my R markdown document, Below the output, I make uh, another section called params, which means um, parameters. I really hope I'm doing this correctly because, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is correct. I did write it down, but now I'm nervous and people are listening to me and then I always get uncertain. Um, so I'm going to do a really real thing because you should usually have like a default setting. In this case, we're going to give it data. So that's kind of important. Um, and it has this weird, weird syntax if you want to run our code in the YAML parameter setting, which you do with the negation and then R and this. Um, I don't know why they decided that this was the way to do it, but that's the way to do it. And then here, instead of saying get my new data, because now I've kind of set the data before, I want 
this piece of code to pick up um, what data I'm feeding through the parameters. And the parameters come into the document like a list. So like any other uh, list object in R, the list itself would be called params. Oh, sorry, can't spell. Params. And since I'm calling it data, it would be underneath data. And then we save it. And if I did this correctly, which I'm very much hoping I did, uh, when I knit this, I didn't do it correctly because I'm nervous. Thankfully, uh, I obviously omitted that slide, but This is what I do whenever I forget. Um, I think you can unindent it. I think I want. Oh yeah, it's the indent. Yeah, I always get that wrong. Like I, yeah, I always get the indentations wrong. This is the way. You see. It's uh, indentations, always, always the indentations. It always gets me. Um, thanks, Lena. <laughs> um, okay, so I mean, so this doesn't, um, this is not very um, mind blowing at the moment because it's literally using the same data that we were using before. So the report is exactly the same. So let's try giving it some other data. Now, because because we are using specific columns in the data, it means that whatever data we feed it has to have a year column. It has to have a pop column and to be able to both run the plot and to run the model. But whatever data we give it that has pop and year should work. So I'm gonna do, Oh, not there. Sorry about that. I had my cursor in the wrong place. So we're going to make some random data. I don't know. Super simple. Data frame. Year equals, well, it's going to be too little. No, OK, I'm going to do. At my, I can't spell. It's so hard to spell when people are watching you. I'm just going to filter it to have year below, I don't know, 1970? 1970. So it's not so random data, but it's just some other data. So now I've made, I basically subsetted the, the Gapminder data to only years that are um, before 1970. So if we go back to the R marked out render uh, function, we can now use the params um, argument. And you have to give it a list because it's expecting a list. It's expecting a named list. And in that named list, it needs to have data. So data equals random data, data. Make sure you spell it correctly. And there we go. And again, it doesn't open it because it's not the same kind of uh, interactive version. Um, but we're gonna open it in a web browser. And then suddenly you can see, like before, let me make this a little bit smaller because now it's, oops, taking the whole window because we can compare it to the other report we had. Um, where you can see in our original report, we had years from 1950 to 2000. I think it's 2012. 
But now we subsetted the data, so it was only in 1952 uh, from uh, years below 1970, basically. So suddenly we have this possibility of like we can make the same report for every 10 years or whatever. I mean, it doesn't really make sense in this case, but um, let's say you had that type of data that was you have the same type of data from 15 different centers and each center wants a single report with only their data. Um, and then you can just say, yeah, sure, here's a little for loop and you just loop through all of the data files you have. Super nice, right? Uh, or you have a coworker and you're like, and he's like, oh, I wanna, I wanna run the same analysis you did and make that report. And you say, yeah, sure, here's the template. Um, just give it the data you want. And then they just get it. I think it's pretty magical. And you can, there are no limits to the amount of parameters you can add. You just need to define them both uh, when you render it and, um, uh, and in the YAML of the document itself. So I'm going to do one more thing with the... Um, parameters uh, because I think it's pretty cool. So the scenario here is that we're making a report to someone who doesn't care about the code. But what if you're kind of switching between there's one person that cares about the code and then there's another person that don't, doesn't care about the code and you kind of, ugh, you don't want to be like remaking all of it for, for different people. So let's say we just make another parameter called echo. Maybe not call it exactly the same. I'm gonna call it echoes just because I don't I don't like it when things have the same name as arguments I'm passing, it confuses me. I'm gonna call it echoes and by default, I'm gonna set it to false because uh, by default, we're assuming that people don't wanna see the output. So if you're giving it to some, uh, the code, it. So if you're giving it to someone, that will just be what it will run. It will, it will not output the code. But for those people who actually want to see the code, if we now change this part here where we set the echo to false to params echoes, oh, dollar sign, to params echoes, now it will take the value given from the list so that a person that wants to see the code chunks will be able to do that without having to go into your template and manually alter that document. So if we try rerunning that by said, and then we said echoes equals true. It made the report. Gonna need to reopen it. And then suddenly, the code output is there again. Uh, I think that's super neat. So you could even, let's say you can even be working with like interactive documents and then you will uh, want people to be able to toggle on and off the code themselves and they can do that very easily. I think it's, uh, I think that's pretty neat. I actually think it's hella neat. Uh, I've, I've yet to find like uh, a good, I use that for myself, but I've still not been able to like really utilize this function uh, properly yet. So um, I'm hoping I get an excuse to, to do that soon. Okay, so now we've done some parameters. Um, and now, okay, so, Another thing that's really awesome about our markdown, and it's it's really really fun because I actually had a coworker contact me about today, so he couldn't um, he couldn't join um, this talk today because uh, he has kids. Uh, it's the time for dinner and uh, and bedtime soon, so he can join. But he's a Python coder. Uh, he doesn't really do R. I'm an R coder. I don't really do Python. Uh, it's really great working with people that do other things than you. Um, but he was like, I'm, I'm really considering learning R only for R Markdown and I'm really jealous about R Markdown. And while I'm super excited 
uh, for him to learn R, he doesn't actually need to learn R to utilize R Markdown. Because the thing is, you don't need to actually do R in the code chunks. You can use other programs in the code chunks as long as they're installed on your computer and they are supported uh, by R Markdown, uh, which is super cool. So for him as a Python user, he can run Python code chunks in the R Markdown documents as long as he has the reticulate package installed, which, which is a package that translates objects between R and Python. Uh, you can run X SQL if you run with databases and you need to run pure SQL, you can run pure SQL in the code chunks. Um, I work uh, in an area of science where we switch a lot between statistical software like Python and, and R and also with a lot of shell scripting um, because the tools we use are, are command line based. Um, so I can also switch into some bash script um, within the R Markdown document and that is uh, totally fine. So within the doc, like within a single document, you can incorporate quite a lot of different engines, um, which uh, is uh, super cool. Um, I actually forgot, I have several, ooh, now it really jumped a lot again. I had several polls that I forgot to do, but uh, yes, um, that's it. So, um, yeah, so code chunks you can uh, that 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 run uh, as far as I know uh, with with minimal extra uh, dependencies. As I said, for Python you need uh, at least the reticulate package, and it will also probably need to install um, uh, our Miniconda. Uh, you can run uh, SQL. Um, at least I know it runs uh, SQLite and Postgres SQL. Uh, I've done that and that's worked fine. I have run bash uh, shell in there. I've not tried any other shell. Um, and it also runs D3. It can also run stand code if you're a Bayesian and you run things in stand. Um, so it is quite powerful. And um, just to show you how easy it is, I am a terrible Python coder. As I said, I don't actually know how to code anything in Python. Um, so if I do something wrong, <laughs> please, someone, let me know. Um, so x equals 1, min equals 2. Well, actually, that could be just the same as in R code. I should do something that is like quintessentially Python. I can't think of a thing, single thing. Should I run a print there? I probably should. Yeah. No, did it run it? No, it didn't. I'm doing something wrong. Sorry. As I said, I'm a terrible Python coder because I don't code in Python. Um, but this is basically how would you, you would do it. You would say Python. So instead of saying R, you did here, you would say Python. And then it would run some Python command. Or you could say sh, which is the born again shell and then run some awful awk command if you want or uh, whatever. It's uh, super neat. Um, it's really nice when you work interdisciplinary like I do or, or you work with people that uh, run different types of code because you can collaborate on the same document um, but using the code that you're, you're more familiar with, which is nice. Um, or in the case of my coworker who literally wanted to learn R just to use R Markdown, and again, as I'm very happy for him to learn R, I don't think R Markdown alone is a reason to learn um, R if you know Python, because you can do Python within R Markdown itself. Um, so that's super nice. And I actually know other pure Python coders that literally 
only have R and R Studio installed on their computers to work on our markdown documents using Python. Um, so I think that's that's uh, really cool. I think it's really cool that they they put down the effort in in making um, multi engine support um, for an R package uh, for an, yeah for an R package. That was the wrong way. Why is it going the wrong way? Um, okay, so um, there are some tricks. If you don't live in Norway, you probably don't get this joke. Uh, so, um, <laughs> with the image in the background, but um, I do have some favorite tricks um, on the side of actually being able to make a report out of just any R script without doing any extra markdown stuff, um, which I think is def definitely my favorite markdown trick. Um, there are a couple of things that uh, I find especially useful that took me a long time to figure out. Um, uh, and I would like to share with you so that uh, hopefully they will, will make your life a little bit easier once you start using um, our markdown. So for PDFs, as you saw, like when there are LaTeX errors, that is, that is pain. The LaTeX error I have now, I'm, I'm hoping it will be solved by me uh, upgrading Pandoc um, because it's probably out of sync with something now. Um, but one of the things I was struggling with um, with the last paper I wrote in, in Pure Markdown was um, I had some figure captions. Um, and you can set figure captions in the code chunk options. I haven't gone through code chunk options now. Again, you'll find lots of information about that in the links uh, I have at the end. Um, when you have code, when you have kind of complicated and very, very long figure uh, captions, um, that is inconvenient to place in the code chunk options themselves because that's, it's hard to read as a person. It kind of gets formatted weirdly. And you, it's kind of inconsistent if it actually renders the markdown formatting in the figure caption. Um, it's super, super weird. And I talked to the developer of, of um, NIDR and R Markdown, and he said that there, that there is inconsistencies there, and they don't actually know exactly why. But in some cases, um, the caption will be formatted with the markdown formatting you said, and sometimes it will not. And that was frustrating. You're working on a paper. You don't want it to like by accident have the correct formatting. You want the correct formatting every time. Um, and that's when I discovered this super, super strange, but also very interesting way of putting in a figure caption. So it's hard to kind of exemplify uh, here on a slide, but basically, this would be the normal uh, markdown format. So the line would start with this very, very strange thing. With, within parentheses, you say ref colon, and here you can call it whatever you want. This is a reference tag, you give it. So you can call it whatever you want here. I call it figure two cap because that's, um, it's easily, <laughs> that's easy for me to see that, okay, this is the caption that is going to figure two. So it's easy for me to understand once I start writing it. And then I have uh, a caption that has um, an A and a an B that are in bold and some text that is italicized. And this was hard to ma manage within the chunk itself. So this would be an R code chunk. I'm sorry, I couldn't actually get the three back ticks working within this, um, within this slide. So this is an R chunk. I'm calling it figure, I'm calling the chunk. Ugh, sorry, it's very sensitive. I need to stop using it. I'm calling, I'm calling the chunk figure two. I'm gonna stop using my mouse just so you know. Um, and then I'm giving it this figure cap, uh, fig cap uh, option, which says that this is supposed to be my figure caption. And then I'm using that same string that I used on the line before referencing the figure caption, and then it will input that into the figure. Now I haven't actually shown figure captions, but I'm hoping that if you start working on this and you're working on a document and 
suddenly your figure captions are not formatting the way you remember, try. I hope that it will resonate in your mind that I talked a little bit about it and that there is a way to make it work. Uh, I did make a ticket on the GitHub um, repository for, I'm pretty sure it was for NIDR, uh, about this and the maintainer of the NIDR answered with this solution. So I'm hoping you'll be able to find it with some nice Googling too. But there is a way to fix it uh, and that is to basically just define the figure caption before the chunk you're running. Um, that took me like a day, uh, a ridiculous day of being frustrated. Um, when it comes to HTML, so HTML you can make look pretty with all sorts of like um, CSS tricks, these cascading state style sheets which are used in in, um, in HTML to make all web pages look fancy and nice with colors and moving objects and all these things. Um, I'm not gonna go through how to actually make CSS. Again, there's lots of resources online and you don't necessarily have to spend lots of time making um, beautiful CSS, but it's something you can do. And there are packages that will help you make your markdown documents look pretty without having to learn how to do CSS. But if you happen to already know CSS <clears throat> and you do want to do some stuff, um, there are basically two ways you can do it. The first one is the normal way that everyone teaches you how to do. Uh, within the YAML, you define the output as an HTML document, and then you can also define the CSS, and then you point to a CSS file containing um, the style sheet that you want to apply, which is good. Uh, which is good. Um, when you have a huge style sheet you want to apply, but maybe you only want to apply like a font change or a change of, of the font size like I've done here. And it's kind of annoying to have to make a whole file to contain three lines. Like, I don't know, I find that extremely frustrating. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I don't want a file with three lines. I think that's messy. But then again, we've already talked about our markdown being able to run different engines. And if you're already making an HTML document, you can make a chunk and have it run CSS and it will translate it into a cascading style sheet. So that's basically what I've done below here. I made a code chunk, I've defined it as CSS and then our markdown just magically makes that into the like HTML piece of code that is needed to specify CSS. To me, that is pretty, pretty decent uh, and pretty, pretty easy. And um, since um, HTML always works very, very easily, I'm just going to do that here. Um, and I'm just going to change the font size for the normal text to something ridiculous. Um, so now the font size in the document, oh yeah, I have this, I need to take that away. Um, so now the font size in the document should be way too big, like see here? Here's the heading and here's suddenly the text we have because I changed it to a point uh, size of 31 pixels, which is, I guess it's good if it's, if you're sending it to your grandma um, or to someone who uh, struggles uh, seeing small text, but uh, it's super simple. So if that's all you want to do, just change something very, very small it's so much neater to just make a small code chunk with it directly in your document and work with that than have like a whole separate file. I That's personal personal preference, of course. Um, but when I learned about that, I was, I was very, very uh, happy. And then, so, I'm actually gonna skip the sharing and tricks until after I've gone through a couple of the packages I want to show. So I'm nearing the end, so I'm going to have to speed up a bit. So 
I have a single slide uh, with some of the like major blemishes I did, and that cost me some time. Um, so there's a lot of things that can possibly go wrong. As I showed, like there are many steps to making the end document. Um, so in all of those steps, something can go wrong. So one thing I learned is that when you're naming code chunks, don't use underscore, but use the dash. This is very specific to PDFs, um, but it's good to just get into the habit of not using underscores in code chunk naming. And that is because it interferes with LaTeX. Uh, it interferes with LaTeX and it interferes with uh, the specialized markdown uh, meaning of what an underscore means. Um, so just don't use the underscore. Um, when you start getting latex errors, they are different from the one I had, which are of which was obviously because I have some outdated PDF uh, rendering uh, engine. <clears throat> but when you start getting latex errors, um, it's the most frustrating part. But the best, the best advice I can give is to start stripping down your document. Um, so basically, commenting absolutely the whole document out, and then uncommenting it again, bits by bits, until you hit what the problem is, and then you at least have isolated where the issue is, because it can be very, very tricky to isolate where the issue is uh, once it's rendering uh, within LaTeX. Um, so yeah, I do that quite a lot. <laughs> um, HTML is much easier to render than PDF. I think today has kind of been um, an example of that. <laughs> um, HTML rendering also works uh, by default. You don't need anything extra. Um, to render to PDF, you're going to need to install uh, tiny text, for instance. It will tell you that once you try rendering PDF and tiny text is not uh, installed, it will let you know and give you the code to do that. Uh, but HTML is just lots easier to render. Um, and if you can get away with making an HTML report and not a PDF report, I will very much recommend doing that. And custom editing HTML reports are also way easier than customizing um, PDFs because PDFs go to LaTeX. And the only way to really customize a LaTeX report is by doing LaTeX. Um, of course, if you know LaTeX, that is great. If you don't, like I don't, that is more tricky. Uh, and I find CSS a little bit easier to understand than LaTeX, but that is, again, a personal thing. And the last thing um, that usually messes up, at least in the beginning, is when making lists, you need two spaces at the end of each element for it to actually make the element, um, or for it to actually make a breaking line. If there's just a single space, even though the next line starts, like even though the next part starts on the next line, our markdown has this thing where um, it will only make a paragraph if there are two spaces at the end of the line, or if there is a blank line between two lines of, uh, of written text. Um, this took me a long time. Now it's become pretty second nature. I always put double spaces at the end of my items when I'm making a list. To try to remember double spaces at the end when you're making lists, um, or else they will just render as like a single line, not a list. Um, another thing that often causes a lot of confusion and, and I know this seems like I'm going to go environmental on you, and I kind of am. But when you're rendering an R Markdown document, that happens in a completely clean environment. That means that whatever you have in your working space uh, in R when you start knitting has absolutely no effect on the document that you're making. So if you have something in your environment that is necessary for the document to render, your document will not render because it doesn't have access to it once it starts. Um, so that can be a bit frustrating at the start because you're kind of used to everything in your working environment is there for you to work with. 
and it can kind of be a little bit frustrating in the beginning because you're not used to working in that way, but it actually is good that our markdown forces you to work in this way because it actually is a properly reproducible way of working. So if you have things in your working environment that is necessary to run your code, that is not actually produced by the code that is in your document, that being in an R script or an R markdown document, then your code is not reproducible anymore. And then your whole pipeline falls apart. It means that you save it, you close your project, and then you open it again two days later, you suddenly can't run the same code because you're missing some bit that you had in your environment before. That is, that is really bad. So R markdown actually forces you <clears throat> to work in a reproducible way. And that is, um, to begin with frustrating, as I said, but it is a super, um, it, is, it is really good to learn to work in that way. Um, and that also means that as long as like all your data and all, and all these things are accessible from within the folder your document is working in or your project you're working in, you can zip that entire folder, send it to someone else and they should be able to run it as long as they have all the package dependencies and stuff installed. Again, this makes your work reproducible. This is a good thing. This is a great thing, actually. Um, so to end, I'm just going to go through some packages. Well, actually, first, questions. Do you, people have any questions? I've been rambling for like whoo, a long time. <clears throat> Well, we got in a couple of questions. Some have been okay. answered already in the chat, like the shortcuts. Some people were yeah. very informative and showing us all the shortcuts. So that's good. Just check back on that or Google it. Uh, we got an interesting question from Eva. I think she's probably Spanish or Spanish speaking. And this might be, might be something you've tried. Have you ever try to change like figure, a uh, table of contents and all these, you know, English words into, for example, Norwegian. Uh, I have actually not because I work no. in a, because I work in an international lab. So I've never actually had to make a report in Norwegian. Uh, oh, so I'm actually unsure. <laughs> I'm a bit unsure. Am I, in theory, okay. So in the PDFs, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a pain. But in the HTML, like I have, I like, in the HTML, I think it should be possible because it's much tried, easier to. Yeah, I tried Googling it. There seems to be a lang parameter you can pass in your YAML, but as I haven't tried it, no promises. Yeah, that might work. <laughs> that might also, that, that probably works best for like parsing special characters. So if you're working in a language that has very specific characters that are not uh, UTF, um, that should probably work. I know that that is a setting you need to adapt if you're, for instance, doing Chinese, because that's obviously um, not in the same character as the Latin alphabet, because uh, we're all very Western-centric here. But uh, yeah, I have not tried, so I'm sorry about that. But I'm. I mean, I, you can't be the first person that, that would need that. So I can't, and there's a very, very, very big Latin R community. So um, there's a lot of Latin R markdown documents out there. So I, there, uh, I mean, Latin, I say Spanish, Latin American. And so, yeah, it should be possible, I think. Then there, there was a question on the um, uh, navigation menu. I suppose then maybe you need a different package. Like if you want to have uh, several pages in your markdown document. Uh, oh yeah, so that's, I'm coming to that uh, in the peaks. Okay, cool. So that's yeah. coming up. <laughs> and then I guess you're gonna also show how you made your slides, right? Uh, I can show you how I made my slides. <laughs> so when I publish the slides online, uh, I'll not only publish the rendered slides, I will also publish the R Markdown document that makes the slides. So you can, you can see both. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and for that, you, have you used, uh, I think there were a couple of questions, uh, IO slides, Slidey or Sharingan? 
so this is a Sharingan um, presentation. I prefer Sharingan. I've uh, I tried IO slides and I tried Beamer. I found them um, difficult to work with um, because they go through LaTeX. So, um, well, IO slides doesn't, Beamer does, but I didn't, um, I can't remember actually why I didn't stick with IO slides, but, um, but I remember Beamer goes through LaTeX. I found it very hard to to make it look the way I wanted it to. I'm very peculiar <laughs> or, uh, in, in how I want something to look. And so that didn't work for me. And then someone tipped me uh, about Sharingan and it was like magic. It is like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I find it very easy. I already know a little bit of CSS, so it's not that hard for me to, to, to fix. Yeah. I have the the same idea. The Sharingan seems to work fantastically, so it's I will so also good. keep doing that. And there was also a comment uh, that your slides are gorgeous. So I think there is support from that in the in the chat as Thanks. well. <laughs> yeah. uh, Janelle asks if there is like a specific photo resolution you need for your slides to make them look nice. Ah, well, okay, yeah. So that is. <clears throat> that is always tricky. So there are a couple of the images I've used here that are not uh, of as good resolution as I would hope. Um, at the end of the day, the photo resolution you use is mainly uh, dependent on the screen that you will be showing them on. So in this case, I wasn't, I, I didn't spend too much time finding the absolutely best images because I assumed most people would be on kind of small-ish laptops um, so the images would probably look pretty decent, even though the resolution wasn't awesome. If I was doing this um, for the the 99 inch uh, display we have in our presentation room at work, I would take the time to get the biggest, baddest resolution images I can find, um, which is not easy. Uh, but uh, mainly, so for photos, I would just try to find photos that have as good resolution as possible. When it comes to plots, there are things you can do in in um, in the R Markdown uh, code chunk settings that will make your figure resolutions better. So in my case, so I can I can pop up my. Um, our studio. So at the top, actually, of my presentation document, I have a chunk setting for all of my figures made by uh, all the figures made by um, by the R code chunks themselves, like the ggplots and stuff. I've set that to I've set a setting called Fig Retina three. So by default, it's set to two, and that usually creates a kind of cloudy, blurry kind of uh, ggplot that doesn't look good. So I set the figure, um, set the retina to three, and that makes them much, much crisper. You can also set something called the DPI. Again, that makes, um, it, it makes the document render a little bit slower. So it means that uh, once you set the rendering to start, um, it will take a little bit longer before the end document is produced because higher DPI means longer rendering time, uh, but it will make the figures much crisper. So if you know you're presenting on a really big screen, I would just <laughs> ramp up those parameters as much as I could, uh, as much as my computer could basically, because it kind of depends on what your computer can handle um, to make them crisp. Do you, would you yeah. use both of those at the same time or is it? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Both. Okay. Uh, both on the yeah, both together. So one um, yeah, always. In this yeah. case, I didn't care too much about the DPI. The DPI is naturally set to seventy two, which is usually good enough um, for a small screen. Um, but I would probably ramp it up to I don't know one hundred and twenty, one hundred and fifty minimum for a large screen. Cool. That's that's really useful. I'm gonna do that for my plots from now on because sometimes. <laughs> I find that they're not as uh, like sharp, crisp as I like them to be. Yeah, that um, yeah does really happen. So 
So that's cool. Um, I think someone asked for some more inspiration, but I think that's probably coming up in your yeah. resources. Yes. So I'm just going to so go gonna very, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go very quickly because we're technically ending in like now. Um, and I've been talking for like two hours, which is longer than I expected to be. Um, but um, so there are some packages. Uh, there are several packages that do uh, our markdown specialized things. We've already talked about a couple of them. So one is Bookdown. I love Bookdown. So Bookdown is great when you have you need to make something that has chapters, appendices, uh, yeah, all these things. So, and all of the R Studio team, they keep publishing uh, book down books on everything. Um, there's a book down book on book down, um, <laughs> which I think is pretty awesome. Um, uh, I use it at work. We have lab manuals and, and documentation written in book down books and rendered. Um, for online use, you can also render them to PDF book documents and even ebook documents that will work on a Kindle, uh, which is also pretty cool. <laughs> um, it makes this really nice uh, setup uh, where you can see oh, this mouse. Now you see all the things I want to go through. Um, that makes this nice table of contents on the side, and you can easily navigate, and it just looks super super nice i i think bookdown is really um quite an amazing feat by yeah uh, um then there's the page down um package um if you want to make html documents that are paginated um so a normal pa uh, html document is just like a single page and you just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and it has it can technically have no end. Uh, you can keep scrolling. Um, but if you need something that uh, has pages, but you still want to render them uh, for online use, page down uh, is the thing for you. Um, there's like a small snapshot of it on the side here. It's the page down page on page down. Um, it can also make, uh, it also has templates for resumes and business cards and, and a couple of other things. And it's um, pretty nice. So if you already know our markdown, this is like a very simple way um, of like continuing using and, and elevating that. I found post around again. I'm so, just so happy for our markdown because all of my work is in R. Things I develop are in R. So whenever I want to present something at a conference or whatever, it's usually is R related and it's usually a combination of code I want to display and output of code I want to display. And this is just so tedious to copy paste between like PowerPoints and whatever. And then I found poster down and it really just takes um, our markdown and it makes, it has different templates. You can adapt the colors, you can do all these things. It's HTML, so it takes CSS. So if you already know that, that is also extremely simple. He, um, Brent Thorne, who made this package, he has some pretty nice tutorials on how to use it. And it is, I really do recommend it. I think it looks very crisp uh, and neat and much, and very, very tidy. So very much recommend post around. Um, blog down. I'm gonna do some shameless um, promotion of myself. Uh, I blog, when I blog, I blog about R and I blog about neuroimaging and coding. So it makes sense for me to have a blog that supports me being able to run code chunks. Um, again, Yehi is like the master of everything R Markdown and made the blog down package, which runs on this thing go, um, called Go Hugo, and that renders uh, blogs. And you can write blog posts in R Markdown, and it's uh, really awesome. And uh, if you want to check out my blog, it's called drmovingkills.io. Uh, um, and I blog about R and neuroimaging, and a combination of those sometimes. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's also working on a new Our Ladies uh, web page for the global uh, team. And we're also using um, Blogdown for that. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a super package. 
Uh, another package is the Vitara package, um, which is actually uh, super nice. I used it uh, recently. I know Isabel used it recently to make her uh, resume. Um, in contrast to Page Down, which makes resumes in HTML, uh, Vite makes resumes in PDF that so goes to through Latex. They are super crisp. They're super nice. They look extremely professional. And there's just, they're just in a whole other ballpark than the resumes I've been used to working with. Uh, and a good thing about having your resume in our markdown is that you can actually automate it. So you can, for instance, um, you can have it, for my case, it can get my citations and publications from Google Scholar. Um, so, once I want to update it, I can literally just press go and it will get the newest number of citations. I made a small plot in it and um, I don't have to do lots of extra things. Um, and my resume looks nice, crisp and new and I can impress um, prospective employers with that. Um, really, really recommend it. For those of you developing packages, um, package down is like, it's magic. You literally don't even need to know markdown I'm assuming you probably, if you already make packages, you're documenting them with Rocket, Roxygen and you're making big nets with R Markdown. You don't even need to do anything else than run a single line of code and it will make the online documentation um, websites, as you see, for instance, for the package for ggplot and all of the tidyverse packages, they have these online um, websites and this package that is where it comes from basically it makes those um my packages have online documentation not because i know how to make a web page but because package down exists uh and it really is quite it's quite magical and i mean it's hadley so we can expect that from him and then it's sharingan which this entire presentation is made in um it is really an impressive piece uh, of a package. In my opinion, it's, it's, it's the best presentation package I've worked with. I always get my slides to look the way I want. There is constantly new things I learned to do uh, in Sharingan that I didn't know was possible before. Um, and in this case, there is no way I can top Alison Hill's uh, guide to Sharingan. Her slides are impeccable. Her explanations are impeccable. She goes through absolutely everything. If you want to make slides like I do and I strive to be like her, uh, you should definitely go through um, her slide deck. It is super impressive and it's super cool and uh, that's where like all you're going to learn much more of the details than I, I could have taught you today. And I didn't go that way because her slide deck is so good that I, I don't think, I don't even want to dare try to do it, to do the same. It is super, super good. Um, and I'm just gonna, the last part is, I've never used Flipbook R, but it's really, really cool. Um, and it's an interactive way of learning, teaching and learning people to code um, uh, that is made in a really ingenious way. So again, it's, it's a kind of a slide kind of thing. She calls it a flip book because you, kind of, you can flip through, through it like it's a flip book. So in this case, it's trying to teach you line by line how to build a ggplot. You start with the gapminder data, you give the gapminder data to ggplot, you give ggplot an AIS, which then renders the x-axis because you've specified x. You give it a y, and then suddenly the y-axis pops up with a minimum and maximum. And then, oh, I went too far, um, and so on. And it's really like a nice, um, if, you, if you work with teaching and you're teaching people how to code um, and things, this is really a really good resource uh, of how to set that up. Uh, nicely and I know I'm gonna start using that for my teaching it's super impressive now suddenly I'm back to the start um, and so totally at the end uh, I am 10 minutes over time and uh, 
there's a cheat sheet for Markdown. Uh, I use a lot, a lot. You should use it too. There is a shortcut to it in your Art Studio um, in Help. There's a cheat sheet tab. You should use this. You should use the cheat sheets. <laughs> they are very, very good <laughs> um, for many things. Um, suddenly, I can't find the Markdown one, but there is a Markdown quick reference. If you press that, it will actually show up in your help. And this can, like, it's a good reminder. It's good to have there when you're working on the document and you don't remember exactly how to do things or you don't know how to do things yet. It's a nice research to kind of uh, help you learn how to do things, basically. Um, why does it always pop back to the stop? Um, yeah. And then for those who are in science, uh, I recommend the articles package from RStudio, which contain uh, LaTeX templates for almost every scientific journal out there, uh, meaning that you can pre-format your paper to look exactly like the journal wants, and you don't have to struggle with their horrible online template tools. Um, anyone who's gone through that knows what I mean. It is really, really cool. I recommend uh, getting that and, and trying to use it. And then if you're using Sharingan and you have no idea about CSS, you don't care about learning CSS, but you still want your slides to be cool and kind of have your personal flair on them. There's the Sharingan themer package, which recently was released on Chrome. And um, it's a very, uh, it's a nice package for easily uh, adapting uh, a Sharingan theme so that it better reflects what you want. The theme I'm using is the Our Ladies thing that actually Alison Hill made. Um, and yeah, that is it. So I can stick around a little bit longer for some questions if you have that. Uh, otherwise, thank you everyone for coming and for listening to me for two hours straight. <laughs> that is a long time. <clears throat> I'm already hoarse. All right, so if there are questions, please let me know. I finally have the chat up. Oh, guys, you're so nice. <laughs> okay, so... Um... Yeah, okay. Um, we don't actually have a list of all the part. Well, we have the meetup list. So if you're on the meetup list, um, sure, um, I can share them at least there, but I will try to wrestle up the courage to actually put this online. So I will try. I did, I did do some fail in there, so I'm a little bit apprehensive, but I think that's... Uh, but I think it's okay. I think everyone knows the pain of PDF some suddenly not working. Oh, to PPT. Um, I don't know how to quickly do that, actually. I have not, I did it once to just to check that it works. So I know that it's possible, but I haven't actually, but I haven't done it since, and it's probably like a year ago. Well, I, I'm not sure if the question means that it has to be a PPT. Maybe it's just a presentation. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, of course. Um, I will push it up to GitHub um, very, like, now, soon. Oh, I need to get some food. But after I get some food, I will uh, push it to GitHub, and I will uh, link it in, in the Meetup uh, comment section. The CV template. So that yeah, so that actually comes directly from the Vitaya package. So if you install the Vitaya package, you will um, you will like me. So if you make an R Markdown document from scratch, I didn't actually show this part. So that's a decent thing to show at the end. There is so before I just started a document from scratch. You can also start from template. In my case, I have quite a lot of templates installed uh, because I have a lot of packages installed. But for instance, here you see there are four um, Vitae um, templates already. So you can just pick one of those, look at what it looks like, and then start figuring out, uh, yeah. 
So most of the packages um, that are based on Markdown or create some sort of specialized Markdown will also come with templates. Uh, so once it's, in, in, once it's installed, uh, restart your RStudio so that the templates can be visible in your template section. And then you can kind of um, have a look at um, what you got, basically. So you see here I have, there are two shagans. It's One is just a normal presentation in Yan, the one, the one, the other one is in simplified Chinese because um, that requires some extra stuff and the creator is Chinese. So for him, it made sense to make a very specialized Chinese template. And here are some templates that I specifically made for my work and that have our branding and such uh, already pre-made. Pre All right, then I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs> uh,